At the end of the 70s, Paul Cleary with his brother Lar and friend Pat Larkin formed the Blades in Dublin's Rings End. Over the next few years, with a few direction and lineup changes, the band built up a reputation as one of the country's most popular live acts and released a string of classic Irish singles, all written by Paul Cleary himself. In early 86, the band performed for the last time. In 1983, he was voted Ireland's number one songwriter by the readers of the Hot Press, above the likes of Bono, Van Morrison, Paul Brady and Chris de Berg. Two years ago, he wrote the chart-topping Irish Ethiopian single, Show Some Concern, and last year, he was the only man to refuse to play at Self-Aid. Now he's got a new band called The Partisans. So, for the next half hour, you can hear some of the best Irish pop songs of the 80s and listen to Paul Cleary. OK, Paul, here we are, yeah. away from the hustle and bustle of the city centre. How's life treating you in mid-1987? Life's treating me very well, Dave. I have a new band. Yeah? Uh, which is the Partisans Mark II, but it's the, it's the real Partisans as I see it. It was a while uh, getting a bass player and a drummer. And we were ages in rehearsal, so I thought I'd never get back out on the boards. But uh, back we are. We've made a new mini album too called Impossible. So I'm pleased with that. I'm pleased with this band. I think it's the best band I've been in, really. You know? And when you say back on the boards, I always get the impression that when you are in a band, when you've had a band dance through the years, Partisans won or Blades before that, that you like playing gigs around Ireland. Mm. Funny enough, the break -up, after the breakup of the Blades, it was... Uh, take a seat, Dave. Ah, thanks, Bob. It was more difficult to get the gigs because the Blades were very popular around the country, and especially with the two LPs we made and so on. So it was difficult to get the gigs with the Partisans, although a lot of people were aware of Paul Cleary, they were a bit reluctant to take the new band, you know? Yeah, but at the same time, I mean, you had built up a good reputation, so it's not as though the promoters didn't know how good you were, for instance. Yeah, the promoters knew, but I think the promoters' fear was, uh, you know, that the kids mightn't come and see the Partisans, that they still wanted to hear the Blade stuff, you know? Yeah. Although we still do the Odd Blade song, because they're my songs anyway, you know? Yeah. You only do the Odd Blade songs? I mm. mean, do you not think that there's an audience out there who still hasn't heard those classic five Irish singles? And uh, yeah, but the records are there if they want them. I still feel that if we become popular with the Partisans, that if people want to hear the old stuff, they can buy it on record. But there's no point in playing the same songs for four or five years on the track. No, we can When Paul takes a trip out of Dublin She's on the work to what she says we post up Every now and then, it's a sense we Put a blame on education, call it separation. Got it go, stop it yet. We never had. Got it go, stop it yet. We were lucky at that time because there wasn't that many bands, and like now, like there's hundreds of bands in Dublin alone. Then there wasn't that many bands, and the standard was pretty low. So because we had our act together, I still think we were overpraised then because I think we weren't as good as people said we were. There was a lot of flaws in the music. What we had was because the three of us are from Rings End, we had a, we had a certain spirit which a lot of bands hadn't got. We were good live and so on, but uh, we weren't as good as people said we were. But at the same time, I mean, like, just take the first three singles. I mean, Hot For You, Ghost of a Chance, and The Bride Wore White and that. I mean, do you not think that they were, like, if, can I not just say classic Irish singles? Uh, I like Ghost of a Chance. They're good singles. I think The Bride Wore White was a good song. Uh, 
I think it was badly recorded. That was my fault because I think I produced that one. I think that was the first song I tried to produce that was badly recorded, but I think it's a good song. I think what helped that too is we done a video for uh, Anything Goes, Bob Collins, I think he, he directed it. It was a very good video, it was very different, it was black and white and so on. And that had a lot of impact too, you know. know what the songs are built that's why uh, people think I'm a good songwriter because I take a lot of time and uh, I like to write from different angles I mean you know people say I'm a, I write political songs and so on I don't really uh, only about sort of 20% is, is uh, can be described as political and even the political songs are, you know there's a cloak of ambiguity if you like around them because I don't want to say uh, you know vote for such and such or vote for such and such but 80% of the songs are love songs so if you're going to write love songs you have to think of different angles yeah. yeah but at the same time like Paul Cleary has always been looked upon as a man who if you say okay people said political songs mm. like the songs were written from a working class socialist perspective if you like the love Is songs that, yeah do you not think so no I don't think uh, because as I said when we began uh, there wasn't that many working class bands rock and roll was a middle class sport in Dublin uh, you know People got their daddies and mummies to buy them guitars and so on. Uh, so we were different then. That's why, in a way, we were patronised a lot by the, the journalists yeah. and so on around, because here's a little working class band, let's throw sugar at them and so on, you know. Now it's different, you know. Yeah, but people like the music, Paul. I mean, those mm. golden days in the magnet, right, for starters. And then, like, I remember those classic support slots to you two at the Baggett. Yeah. When, I mean, you know, you two were coming up, they were doing quite well. They weren't exactly a major band or anything yeah. at the time. But, I mean, like, there was 100 people turned away each time. And I remember a lot of people, when you finished your set, would, would leave. I mean, like, they didn't, didn't that stay. that you two making a video? <laughs> <laughs> no, but they used to leave, you know, because yeah. I mean they were there to see the Blades, a lot of people, and that was just the first single yeah. time. Funny that, because it was us and you two, we were the bands that were vying for position, we were the two, I suppose, most popular bands, and the bands most likely to make it. So sort of a competition between ourselves and you two to see who would be the most popular. I think they've won out on that one. <laughs> 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 I made a lot of mistakes. I signed things I shouldn't have signed and so on. Uh, I think most bands go through that. Uh, bands like you two, I admire their commitment and so on, and they were lucky in that they, they had everything going for them. They, they, their manager was on the case and, and so on and so on. And they had the right record company who put money behind them. Air record companies, they, I don't know, they seem to sign us and we'll see what happens. I mean, they, never, they were never willing to put in the, the work the way we were, you know. Mm. Uh, and as I said, we weren't quite ready then anyway. We played a few gigs in London the time we signed the first record deal with Energy. And I don't think we were, we weren't ready for it. If we'd, if we'd have had, uh, if people had bought our records then, I think we would have died after a year or two anyway. You know? This award goes to a man who through his songwriting and through his steering of his band, The Blades, to prominence in the Irish rock scene, goes to Mr. Paul Cleary of The Blades.
Do you ever think in some ways that other bands have passed you by and you feel unfair <coughs> because if talent is supposed to be the bottom line, mm. that a lot of them don't have the same sort of talent as you obviously had? Well, I don't think talent is the bottom line anyway in, in, in the music business. Uh, I don't feel frustrated by it because, you know, I think the public gets what the public wants, you know. And uh, if you, if you, why are you talking about bands getting a big deal if you don't play much around? Mm. Well, that's that's two ways. There's two ways of doing it. You can have what you think is a genuine working band, which is the way I've always done it. You can play around the country. Or you can have the band who goes for the, the big deal as such, who uh, takes you know takes care of their appearance and makes sure they you know, maybe look like Gerard Duran or something like that and make a very expensive video. That's another way of doing it. And that's just as uh, yeah. viable, if you like. <laughs> Father, I confess in my ignorance and haste. I was caught out with this girl, now I am no longer chased. Human instinct is a flaw in this theory you have been. biggest local band in Ireland. Uh, it became a problem where people wouldn't come to the gigs there because we, they thought we were exclusively a rod band. So there was, the, there was a stigma, if you like, attached to all the blades, they said the Fred Perry's, they're a rod, they're a rod band, they're a, a second jam and all this. Which was, that's one of the reasons why I got rid of the brass section, because the brass was connected with uh, maybe the two-tone ska thing and, and the whole soul revivalist thing. Uh, you know, I want to have a band where anybody can come and see us, whether it be, you know, from a hippie to a skinhead to a, anything, you know? Yeah. Well, what about one other side of it then, from the press to the fans to musicians in Ireland and the respect that you have within the Irish music sort of circles, which is, um, was shown best of all by the fact that uh, when Bob Geldof did the Ethiopian thing, that you did one for Ireland. Mm. And that got to number one of the Irish charts and you got all the Irish musicians in on it. And every single one, every time they were interviewed, said, great songwriter, brilliant musician, what a man, brilliant stuff and all that. Did that make you feel good? It does. I wonder 
will they say if I become successful? I mean, int if I become successful internationally, because it's always nice to pat someone on the head who hasn't quite made it. So, uh, but it is nice to get compliments off of the musicians, of course. And that, well, that was the uh, the show some concern when I'd not been involved in the organisation of that. That was like Jerry Wright from RTE and, and Mark Kenner, who was managing me at the time. So uh, all I did was write the song, and Bill Whelan arranged the song. He didn't get much credit for that, but he actually done, done most of the work on that song. Things don't change, it's still the same. We are so anxious to parade our shame. But that's just the Western way. What do you say? Fate can't feed and hope can't last. With charity spelled G U I L T. You could say. If these musicians turned around and became really successful and said, ah, you know, I mean, like in other words, it's easy to pat you on the back when you're not that famous or something. Uh, would, uh, would that worry you? No. Uh, what I mean, it's, it, it would be par for the course, wouldn't it? I mean, you always knock people when they're successful. It'd be par for the course, but it's not like a bit negative about all this in some no. ways. I mean, like, do you, I think do you're you, negative. Do you, you're asking me the negative question. Yeah, but do you not think? Well, I mean, you make them positive. Then <laughs> the answer is positive. The you positive things positive. I have to say about the new band. The new band is good, and I am positive about that. That's what I mean. I know when people talk to me, they want to talk about the blades and so on and the and the odds. That's that's understandable now that they sort of put me in context, if you like. But I mean, I'm, I really am happier with this new band. Uh, I'm the oldest member of the band, which is which is uh, unusual. This is the first time I've been the oldest member of the band. You know, we've Tony Smith and, and Damien from Navin, who are I think 22, and Connor, who's been with me for the last three years, who's becoming one of the best guitarists I think around. Other musicians are beginning to talk about him now, as well as talking about me being a good songwriter, saying, and Connor Brady is a brilliant guitarist. Paul's new band, The Partisans, came into RTE recently to record their 20-minute slot for a TV series called The Session, which you can see in the autumn. The other two 20-minute slots in the one-hour programme are taken up by two other Irish bands, Light a Big Fire and, as you can see here, in Tuanua. For this programme, the three lead vocalists, that's Leslie Dowdell, Tom McLaughlin and Paul Cleary, they got together for their own version of Sitting on the Dock of the Bay. And also, Paul performs a country duet with Tom McLaughlin, who's on the left-hand side here. Paul's best-known country collaboration was with Ray Lynham back in 1985. Down through the years, Paul has always been very positive towards invitations to play with musicians he respects. It tends to be a little bit of rivalry when bands come after each other. And I think it was just so, if one person from each band sort of shared the stage, it would sort of make it more uh, communal, if you like. Yeah. Someday may be a friendly call Did you cry that night? Do you cry at all? Another long and painful day With midnight colors blue
were talking about publicity and sort of getting yourself together in terms of projection and all getting over hassles and things. And that's the self aid concert, which was at, on May the 17th last year at uh, the RDS. Now, the Blades would obviously be offered one of those prime slots on that. You were offered one of the prime slots on that. For every band that played there, there were 10 that wanted to play. And only yeah. one band said no. Only one person said no. Yeah. And that was Paul Cleary. Yeah. First of all, were you speaking for the band or for, just for yourself? No, I, I always, like, in political terms, I speak for myself because it's not fair on the band. The Blades had broken up. I think we were asked to do as the last gig for the Blades. I think the Blades had broken up at the time, anyway, but we had the new partisans gone. But I just didn't feel I just didn't feel it was good. Um, I'd like to do the gig if it had been for maybe a genuine charity like Simon Community, because it was a good uh, showcase, if you like, for Irish bands. But I didn't feel happy. Uh, instinctively, I didn't feel it was a good thing to hang the unemployment issue on it, you know. Surely you realised that something big was going to come out of it. I mean, for instance, we're talking MTV in the States in terms of a two-hour package. We're talking about a, a live double album which is going to sell all over the world and be in homes everywhere. And that Paul Cleary or the Partisans or whatever could have got a contribution in there. And it would have been one major step up very easily for you. I did realise that. And that was one of the... There was a few people who were saying, it. well, look, just do it anyway for the, to get the band recognised and so yeah. on. I realised that because of after Live Aid, a lot of the bands that appeared in Live Aid, the Wembley one, their sales had tripled and quadrupled after that. So that was that was obvious. But I mean, I didn't agree with it. So therefore, I'm not. I mean, you shouldn't have to uh, hang your career on maybe no. getting on the same stage as you two or whatever and using somebody else's crowd and so on. You know what I mean? I, I think if a band can't make it on their own by playing their own gigs and doing what they want to do, then it's not really worth our while anyway. You know? Well, then presuming you have views on various issues, just like any man in the street does, would you go further and say that you're politically active? No, I mean, if I was politically active, I wouldn't be in a band, that's the whole thing. I've got too involved in the politics, I think, in the last two or three years, where people see me now as being a, a political artist, if you like, which is horrible, rather than being what I am, a, a good songwriter and a good performer. So that's why I'm trying to shy away from the political stuff now and re-establish the band. Because I never went into it, music to be a politic, to make political statements. I went in because I enjoyed pop music, you know. Well, Paul Cleary, the musician, fine, but what about Paul Cleary, the person? I mean, where do your politics lie? If you have about three hours, I could explain <laughs> it to you. I don't really want to get into the, the politics of it now, you know what I mean? As I said, I'm, I hope you're interviewing me for being Paul Cleary, the musician. Well, we're doing that as well, but yeah. I mean, can I not just ask for Paul Cleary, the man, as well? Well, I mean, I have a good deal of political views. For a well, no, I don't really want to talk about it. <laughs> I think one of the problems with the band, with the Blades, has been that uh, the songs are good and people recognise the songs as being good, but getting a band that will uh, make the best job of the songs is having a good vehicle for the songs, which I think I have now with the Partisans, which I hadn't got with the Blades. The Blades are a great live band, but it was like a train going down a track at 100 miles an hour. It was a lot of energy, but it still had the spirit of sort of uh, 77, if you like. Well, some people would say that Paul Cleary is like a train going down a track at 100 miles an hour <coughs> without stopping to maybe say to himself, well, maybe I should compromise here. It's a bit stubborn about it all, mm. you know, that you have one vision and that's it. Yeah. But this is the only thing I can do, so I might as well do it the way, I, the way I like to do it, you know what I mean? Yeah, but if the way you like to do it hasn't necessarily worked out the way you'd like to, yeah. uh, wish it would hope to have worked out, well then, you know, how about trying <laughs> some other way, you know? No, I still think it will work out. I don't think I'm that stubborn. Or I think that's just a myth, you know? I'm not stubborn. Or I compromise. I do, I do compromise. I shaved before I went on stage. You know, <laughs> <laughs> Would you give him a welcome, please? An outstanding young talent in Ireland. His name is Paul Cleary. <laughs> Slow motion and 
wasting time But we don't kiss We just wonder But some people smile We just wonder But some people smile Paul Cleary, ladies and gentlemen, believe you me, you'll be hearing about him more.